Welcome to Good Morning Hospitality, your one-stop shop for the latest news, noteworthy trends, and thought-provoking discussions across the industry. From hotels and short-term rentals to all things travel and hospitality, you'll find each episode equips you with the information that you need to start your week. Join us on Good Morning Hospitality every Monday, wherever you get your podcasts. Hey, Good Morning Hospitality listeners. We are back with incredible offers from Sojo and TravelNet Solutions just for you. Sojo is making amenity management a breeze. Connect your reservation calendar, choose from their eco-friendly amenity catalog, and leave the rest to them. Assembly, organization, delivery, all on autopilot. And exclusively for you, our listeners, enjoy a 30-day free trial of Sojo's game-changing service. As for TravelNet Solutions, they are revolutionizing property management with their Hospitality Hub. It's a complete integrated solution for modern hospitality needs. Dive into this powerful platform and see how it can transform your operations. Exclusive access for our listeners at goodmorninghospitality.com slash partners, or you can just grab the link in our show notes. Stay on top of your hospitality game with these unbeatable offers from our partners. And now back to the episode. All right. Good evening. Afternoon. Afternoon. It's, Afternoon. All, it's evening. <laughs> I took a red eye here. So it's evening. Oh, well, it's good to see you guys in person. How are you feeling? Uh, it was an early morning. So if we sound a little boggled today, yeah. then, uh, apologies, <laughs> but we're live from Calcoon Hills in New York. Well, do you want to tell the people why we're all together or should we just leave that as a secret for a future future date episode? Future episode. All right. Yeah. Okay. So well, we're secret together. location. Yeah. We're together. <laughs> That's all that matters. The crew is together. Public location. Secret Public location. Reason. Secret reason. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. I also got up very early this morning. So. <laughs> yes. And uh, we're not used to recording in person. I think all three of us. So this is going to, you know, take a. Yeah. Passing the mic, though, we won't be talking over one another <laughs> easily. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so, yeah, it's not your standard good morning, but we hope you're having a great day so far. Good afternoon. No cocktails this time. I was pushing for cocktails, but I was denied. So. The espresso martinis were supposed to be flowing, but <laughs> not today. Maybe tomorrow. I will say just a quick housekeeping item. There's been a lot of new listeners and a lot of new followers, whether it's LinkedIn or other social channels so we want to say one thank you for subscribing and following us Two, to give you a quick recap this show is live every monday and wednesday with our hotel crew and we try to keep it to 30 minutes so the whole point is so it's actionable it's quick and we don't want to waste your time because we're all busy so thanks for tuning in to good morning hospitality and since we flew into new york why don't we discuss a little bit about the new york regulations particularly what the hotel crew had uh, a guest on this week. Can you recap that for us? Yeah. So on Wednesday last week, we had Sarah and Steve sit down with Chip Rogers, who is the CEO and president of America Hotel Lodging Association. And basically, the episode covered a ton of different topics from regulations in New York to then the homeless issue in California and kind of what's going on with legislation there. But Chip had an interesting point of view and, and comment that I actually kind of want Brandy to more or less lead with this, but it, the, the sentiment was around, if you're going to be in short-term rentals, then you need to play on the same playing field as hotels, whether you're Sonder, Vacasa, or an independent individual host. Now that's a big statement to make. So Brandy. Should I take, take a sip of coffee first yeah, before my rant? Uh, yeah. Brandy rant coming in hot. And I love the comparison to Sonder too, because Sonder gets hotel licenses and he should know that. No, he does know that. He made the comment that Sonder is part of the organization. And I mean, Romy and many other urban operators also get hotels. Hotel licensing is not like, that's just really kind of a zoning thing to make sure you can legally operate within the area that you're in. Um, and, you know, to there's a lot of it that I agree with, like, especially if you're a professional operator and it's not so much because a hotelier is telling us that we need to level up, but it's because the guest expectations, there really aren't differences between what they expect from a hotel and from a short-term rental. So maybe 20 years ago, if you rented a house in the Outer Banks for two weeks, you brought your own linens. You were basically like, I'm just renting this house temporarily like my own home, right? For the family. 
and that's just not how it is now. Guests are expecting, like we even will leave, you know, paper towel and toilet paper for like a couple days. And then people will still be like, we've run out. I'm like, well, you've been here for seven days. Like you can go by your own. <laughs> uh, but that's just not the expectation. And especially when you have guests that are booking, not just on Airbnb, but, you know, we have plenty of people that come from Expedia, things like that. So there, there are these kind of merging guest expectations and guest demands. I would say that the operations of a hotel and a short-term rental company are totally different. Um, you have just, I mean, if we're looking at maybe your stereotypical vacation rental, it's a home. It's huge. There are so many more components like the kitchens and the bathrooms and maybe hot tubs and pools and landscaping that's on a per unit basis, right? That a hotel, a hotel really has economies of scale. You have a centralized location and I can even compare it. We have South Florida and New Orleans and our New Orleans markets are is much more like centralized hotel base. Like the buildings are all kind of close together. It's a much smoother operation. Whereas South Florida, like geographically, it's kind of all over the place. There's smaller buildings or some single family homes. It's just like a logis it's logistically much more difficult. Yeah. Now, you know, in our industry, there's a little bit of tension with kind of the hosts, the more individual operators, but to give them some like some slack, these are maybe some people that are entering to have an investment property to make some extra money. I do think having consistency and quality. So a clean home, making sure, you know, we've talked about things like not having your family photos everywhere, but I think if you provide a clean experience and things are put together nicely, then that can kind of be the standard. Consistently, though, hosts rank higher in reviews than professional managers. Well, <laughs> well I, 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 I'm trying to encourage a brandy rant. Okay. Yeah. I I was, I was I like, you're just like, you're like, <laughs> poke well, the bear, poke <laughs> the bear. Okay. Well, yeah, I mean, there's lots of reasons why individual hosts rank higher than professional hosts. And one of those things like we've talked about is just like the volume. Um, so if you're an individual host, let's say you have a one reservation per week, you know, that might be four reservations in a month, you know, and so you are probably providing, you, you can just pay more attention to those mm -hmm. details. And if you are an operator where you have, you know, hundreds of reservations in a month, thousands, depending on your size, you are going to be delivering a good experience, hopefully, but there's obviously going to be more bad experiences than if you were a single operator, just like statistically. So I do want to play maybe a little bit devil, like devil's advocate and bring up a conversation and kind of selfish plug here for all the listeners. We are part of a network called hospitality.fm. And on my other podcast, we had this conversation with like Heather Bayer, Adam, uh, I'm going to butcher his last name, Norky with the art of hospitality podcast and a few others. And basically going into the conversation of like, what do we call ourselves? Cause I had a friend in the hotel segment say, why is it short-term rentals? If it's, you know, the same amount kind of length of stay most of the time, right? Like, okay. If you're at a Romy property for two nights, What's the difference between staying at a hotel there? Granted, there is a difference with like, I'm going to use Robin Cragen from Moving Mountains mm. as an example. Very different type of experience and type of stay, type of trip, type of travel, or type of guest. So basically, the kind of devil's advocate play I want to put here is you mentioned Sonder, and so did Chip on his episode with the hotel crew. They are definitely a little bit different. But now, how do we differentiate if they're if we want to be on the same playing field? then what's what do we call ourselves if that like you can't just separate urban and vacation no i honestly i don't have a great answer for this if i'm being honest like i think that some the i what i hate more than short-term rentals is like the alternative accommodation yeah. space like that doesn't roll off the tongue um and i think we're too mainstream now to be like yeah alternative yeah you're not and it's just you know and it's what is that just everything that's not a hotel and you're totally right like there's a difference between the home that you have to go skiing or to go to the beach and then an urban property but yeah, yeah there, a tree house. there's limited service and there's full service so yeah. you guys are limited service Correct. but with that limited service comes extra bedrooms kitchens fridges but so it really then segments by traveler type or preference you know, if you're traveling with kids, with friends, and, and you're not on a shoestring budget, you tend to want your own rooms. Uh, and then it's also always nice to have a fridge stocked up if you're traveling and, and you like to have an early morning iced coffee or a late night beer. Yeah. Uh, and, and you're in a limited service property. You don't have you know, the ability to go down to the hotel lobby bar. Yeah. But then there is 
the the big difference is like the traditional vacation rental market. It's not like a hotel. Yeah. Yeah. Romy properties, Sonder properties are more similar to a hotel. Correct. A hundred percent. Um and those are that's what's kind of blowing my mind is that like in New York, if Saunders brought up in the vacation rental category, they're wrong. Like they're a hotel. And if even by speaking it in the same vein as is a traditional vacation rental in the Outer Banks, it's night and day. The businesses are totally separate. The softwares are totally separate. Operations, et cetera. So, you know, I, I think what's what I'm most interested in seeing with the New York legislation is how many other cities follow suit in 2024. When when bad regulation ticks in, it tends to snowball, and you know we'll see we'll see what happens. I I, I don't I'm not against hotel licenses for vacation rental operators in city centers, especially, I think that's probably the best way to go. Cause then it is a level playing field, Yeah. but how then do you regulate the single family homes? Yeah. Before? And I think it also, I mean, there's certain, the, the bad regulation piece, like really, I don't know if that's like pulls on a thread. Like I think that some cities might see this and think that New York really had it figured out and continue to enact that. But then almost immediately you have all of these kind of like underground, like people are going to go back to Facebook marketplace because the reality is, is that, I mean, in New York, for example, let's say your hotel room costs $400 a night, which it probably costs more, but you could get a, you know, a short-term rental of Airbnb, an apartment for that amount and split it. Everybody, maybe the you know, people have their own rooms or don't have to pile on top of each other. Like that demand doesn't just go away. And so, I mean, the hotels are pro were probably singing this government's praises when they saw that because their ADRs go up and I mean, good for them. You know, that's what, you know, everybody wants to make more money. Um, but I do think that you see these, what, you know, sweeping bag re regulations will catch on because it just is an easier playbook to follow. And then what's going to happen, my prediction is that some point down the line, maybe it's a year, maybe it's five years, there's going to be a whole other sweep of like undoing all this stuff when they see, because it will take time for the repercussions of all this to be fully formed. And what we've seen time and time again is you can write bad regulations, but the enforcement of it, once you realize yeah. that you can't even enforce the laws that are on Correct. your books, then yeah. you have to unwind it. Or I think I mentioned this the other day, but in San Diego, the home prices plummeted by like 25% when a bad regulation went into play. And then they realized, holy cow, we're crushing our, our sales market, our home sales market. 90 days later, they undid it. So kind of this, this weird pendulum it's it's kind of been quiet, quite frankly, on the regulations yeah. front for a couple yeah. of years, really throughout COVID. Uh, but it seems to be like uh, I would like, say more of the last year, maybe not a couple of years. Well, the, this might start a, a tidal wave of the next <laughs> phase. So, well, so you both have mentioned, you know, prediction. You mentioned twenty twenty four. Let's kind of recap for the listeners. We are going to revisit our past episode back in January where we did do a predictions round table with a bunch of other people in the podcast network. But I'm curious, you know, it is kind of quiet. We were, we were looking at things to talk about before this episode and we're like, okay, like we know there's some stuff coming up, but from an industry standpoint, it is kind of quiet end of year. Where do we think 2024? Is there going to be a theme outside of maybe AI or other things like that? They're going to happen and pop up for the next year as like a kind of a majority theme talking point. I I'm, I think I said this as the prediction this year and it's happened a little bit, but there's going to be more and more m and in the next year. Um, businesses are going to run out of funding and have to do something that they either close or, or end up merging with somebody. So that's my prediction. I don't think it's necessarily a bold one by any means, but you know, the VC market has been dry largely, which means people are going to be towards the end of the runway if they aren't profitable. So, you know, I think focus is going to be on profitability or figuring a way to get out of, of what you're doing. 
Yeah, I would agree with that. I again, I was trying to think if I had any like hot take predictions, and I think that 2024 is going to be still more like a year of caution. You know, I think a lot of markets are see, continuing to see ADR compressions, and I costs are still maybe they've stabilized, but they've still probably eaten away at any sort of margins that you might have had. So I think that the companies that are that will survive will come out like much stronger and, you know, much more agile. But I think that you're right. I think that you'll start to see kind of like the writings on the wall for some people already. And you'll just start, maybe start to see those house of cards fall a bit more. I'll follow that in the sense, maybe not the next year of 2024 being kind of like cautionary. I'll say maybe the first six months we'll, we'll go really in cautious. I think we're going to see a lot of the learnings that you're talking about. And I think, and I'm hoping I've already seen a little bit today while we've been here in person, but I think operators are going to collaborate more on the yeah. back end business side, not just, you know, ADRs and rev parts, but the actual PL items that are really crucial or not crucial. And I'm hoping that we all learn and that elevation phase kicks in into the next six months and that way, or not the next six, but the last, like the tail end six months of the year to then really, you know, standardize and increase that professionalism. I think we, we definitely, yeah. you know, want to all, be good businesses. I think we want to provide hospitality. It's just, yeah, sorry, I'm Speak going for on. yourself. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm like, what? A real business profitable? Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, and that's why I have to agree, you know, like with the hotel side, something that I always get like a little jealous of, I think, especially from like the luxury hotel side is like how much dedication and like resources are put into the hospitality component. Yeah. And I mean, it's really really expensive. <laughs> and so, um, that is, you know, that's one thing that I look at, you know, like Robin at moving mountains, like what they, what they have, like, it's just so luxury and lovely. And I'm like, I would love to be able to roll that out. Um, but another thing you touched on is like the operators collaborating. And that's something I've said before, it's not a hot take, but I love how collaborative the industry is. You know, like, you know, we happen to know a lot of really great operators and then vendors, but just kind of be like, here's open kimono. Like, this is what we're doing. Like, do you also have any of these problems or here's a solution that we've come up with? You should try it and see. And, you know, we've seen that this operators that we've worked with, like, you know, tweak, taking little things from each other and tweaking them because it's not a zero sum game. We don't want to see all these businesses fall. There's also no playbook. There's no Cornell for what we're doing. So it's like yeah. we're kind of having to build that. Everyone in the space is on the cutting edge. We're, yeah. we're building the plan as yeah. we go as an industry. And that's yeah. why that's why it is so collaborative. And that's why there's not, you know, there's, a, there's a few people that are pretty competitive with one another. But largely speaking, the industry is not terribly competitive. Uh, you know, I think the rising tides rise all ships has have happened mm -hmm. and now it's the tide starting to go out and we're, we're seeing who the real strong businesses are they will end up probably acquiring and merging with some of the smaller ones yep and you know consolidation yeah. if you've listened to any anyone's predictions in the past 10 years in the industry they always talk about consolidation yeah. uh i think you know we've seen a lot of consolidation when picasso or v trips or casa go and things like that but the vendor side especially is going to continue to accelerate. Yeah. And I kind of flipping it onto the more of the consumer side, I kind of unfortunately think that the domestic tourism will continue like the hot year of like 21, 22. I still think that is very much in the past. Like, you know, this was one of the first big years of like Europe being reopened and like everyone's in Positano. Yeah. And mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I mean, inflation over the past three years combined is like 20%. So. Yeah. If, unless you've gotten a 20% pay raise. Exactly. I, know I haven't. Yeah. <laughs> uh, discretionary income has, uh, yeah. has continuously eroded. So. so I think that, you know, if, especially if you're in a market, I mean, you can feel that in a place like Miami, it's like, okay, are we going to go to Miami again? Or are we going to maybe go to like the, Down I know, the yeah, whatever, you know? So it's, I think we're going to continue to see that. And because flights are relatively still cheap, um, you know, within That's reason. Okay domestically and i mean depending not on what to spain not just spain <laughs> um i'm hoping not i have a wedding there next year so hopefully those come back down but um yeah i still think you're gonna see people are not just staying domestically that they're going and i think that trips are going to continue to shorten so if instead of taking like that week-long trip it might just be like a long weekend kind of thing yeah. 
yeah, I'm, I'm nothing to add. That's all I got. Thanks, Will. Great, <laughs> great input. Really appreciate that. One quick shout out. Happy birthday to my wife, Kristen. Yeah, happy birthday. I won't say any numbers, but you know. 25. <laughs> she, Again. she likes to say 24, spelt in the New Orleans way. Oh, I like that. I like that. F-A-U-X. Um, but yeah, we uh, will be back next week with more topics and more insight on some of the stuff we're discussing today. Yeah. So thank you to all the listeners who did reach out and say, hey, where's the episode this morning? I'm missing Here it out is. my <laughs> dose of GMH. So you got the good evening or good afternoon, whatever you want to call it. I feel like it's evening. Uh, good afternoon, hospitality version. And since that we're doing this in person, I have to awkwardly reach into the camera Look and here. get ready to not long arms. say goodbye. So thank you all for tuning in and we'll see you all again next week. Week.